Saxon Advanced Mathematics Lesson 36. We're going to do some trig. And what we're going to talk about is angles that are greater than 360 degrees. Okay, we've already done something like this. We've said, what if our angle is negative um, 310? Okay, okay, negative angle tells us to start measuring here. And we start counting off as we go. There's 90, there's 180, there's 270. So that means we need another 40 here, which leaves us with 50 degrees there, right? We call this the initial side of the angle. And we call this the terminal side. All right, now what we're gonna talk about, we've already done this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this idea of the terminal side and apply it to something else. Now, what if we have Uh, John starts us with a 410 degree angle. Okay, well that's positive. So we know we're gonna go this way, right? 90, 180, 270, 360, we're still going. We still have what? From 360 to this, we still have another 50 to go, right? And what that does is it takes us up here to a 50 degree angle, right? Because there's 360 plus 50 more. That gives us the 410. So what that means is that the terminal side of this 410 degree angle is the same as the terminal side of the minus 310. So what we're learning is that the number of degrees in the angle as we're given them is just kind of like directions to find the actual angle. <clears throat> and it's kind of like a, a trail of breadcrumbs that we use to find the actual angle. We've already been doing it with minus signs. Sometimes they're tricky, but we also can do it with angles greater than 360. Let's do one more before we get into the problems with them. Let's try, I'll do it over here. We wanna do minus 770. All right. So this time we're going down, right? So we go 90, 180, 270, 360. 360 plus 90 is 450, 540, um, second, 360 plus 60 is 420. Oh, plus 90, sorry. 450. They're, they're the multiples of 9. This is 540. This is 630. We get all the way back over here, 720. We're still going strong. We still need 50 more, don't we? So this ends up being a 50 degree angle here. And what we see is that our minus 770 degree angle has a co is coterminal with minus 50 degrees, okay? So when we get these great big numbers, we don't let them scare us. We just spin until we get it down to um, a nice simple number and then we go from there, all right? So that's what we're gonna practice doing uh, in a minute where the first problem doesn't seem to require anything hard like that. But later we'll get into crazy angle sizes like that. It, so now we're going to do part B and we're doing sums of trig functions, which we have been doing. And there are no inverse trig functions in this set of problems, right? So there's none of this business where we're going in the opposite direction. Okay, so our first one is cosine of 135 degrees plus tangent of 330. Um, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list my table of the trig signs, right? Plus, plus, plus. Thank you. 
okay? And I might need my quadrantal values, but I'm gonna hold off on that um, be, until I'm sure I need them. Okay, cosine of 135, what quadrant will that be in? It's positive, so that means I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go 90, and then I'm gonna go 45. So it's gonna be in the second quadrant. And it's gonna be a 45 degree angle, right? because this is 90 and that's 45. Okay, so this is 45, and that means it's one of our cute little guys, right? One, one, square root of two. So the cosine of 135 is negative, so it's going to be negative, and cosine is Oscar had a hold, right? So it's adjacent, it's negative one over square root of two. And I can rationalize that right away. I'm gonna multiply it by square root of two over square root of two, and that will give me negative square root of two over two. Okay, let's stop right there. That's this much. And let's try this guy. Tangent of 330, okay, it's positive. So it's 90, 180, 270. It's gonna be in the fourth quadrant, right? And I can see, oh, it's gonna be 30 short. This is gonna be a 30 degree angle. That means this is the 60. This is the side that stays two. This was the side that was chopped in half. So this is square root of three. Okay, tangent in the fourth quarter, oh look, I wrote nonsense, is negative. So that means our value is going to be negative and tangent is over Arthur. So from here, the opposite is one and the adjacent is square root of three, and then I'm gonna rationalize that right away, and I'll get negative square root of three over three. Now, all we have to do is combine these two, right? So it'll be negative square root of two over two minus square root of three over three, and that just means we've got rational denominators, but we have to make them match so we can write them as one happy fraction. We'll multiply this side by three over three, or LCM is six, right? So we'll do three over three, two over two, and our final answer is negative three times the square root of two minus two times the square root of three, and it's all over Six, that's the right answer. Okay, so that was our first problem. That one did not involve an angle greater than 360, um, and neither does the next one. So I'm not sure why John is being so gentle with us. He's just letting us practice. as we go. Um, John does say this though, that I think is worthy. He makes the point that this answer could really take three shapes. It could be left like this, but most mathematicians consider that a heresy because there are radicals, irrational denominators. Some people, and then we fixed it like this. We had it like this, didn't we? Um, some mathematicians might prefer this, but John wants us to go ahead and practice putting them into a single fraction and taking that last step of um, finding the LCM and making the denominators match so we can combine. So different teachers have different preferences and it always makes sense to make sure you know exactly what your teacher wants from you. Okay, and I've made myself clear. Go ahead and put it together. Let's do the next problem. Let me tell you, there are, there are two more of these, counting the one that we're doing now. And then we switch to boat in the river. So here comes our second of three. Example 36.2, evaluate cosine of minus 60 degrees plus cosine, whoops, of 210 degrees. I'm gonna make my chart again because I know these are gonna have values. Every time I write it, I'm just memorizing it a little bit better. Okay, 
cosine of minus 60 degrees, that's gonna be fourth quadrant. We're going down, right? And it's gonna be kind of like that. This is the 60 degrees, so this is our 30, 60, 90. Then I always have to orient myself. The hypotenuse is the two, and this side is the one. That's where we chop the triangle in half, right? And so then that means this is square root of three. Cosine is Oscar had a hold. Cosine in the fourth quadrant is positive. Okay, I'm gonna put the positive sign just to remind myself that I checked it and I'm right. The adjacent side is one and the hypotenuse is two. Okay, so that's our answer. No need to rationalize. 210 positive, let's see, that's gonna be 90, 180, 270, that's gonna be in the third quadrant, isn't it? Do you see how I'm mapping that out? I'm just kind of imagining the quadrant and going, okay, we start here, we go 90, 80, 270 is the whole way, so I know it's gonna be in here. So I know that this is 90, this is 180, so I'm gonna need 30 more degrees. My triangle will look like that. So again, I have one of my good 30, 60, 90 friends. And this is the two and this is the one. Remember the hypotenuse was part of the, if I imagine the original equilateral triangle, this was one of the original sides. This is the side I chopped in half and this is the side I got from Pythagoras. Okay, cosine, as I said before, is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I rem remind myself of which sides I'm trying to gather up. I'm in the third quadrant. So cosine is negative, okay? So I'm gonna put that right there. Um, and I want the adjacent side, which is square root of three, and the hypotenuse, which is two. All right, well, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? That's that. And all we have to do is mush them together, and I'm just going to write that over here it's gonna be one minus the square root of three all over two. That's our final answer. Yay. All right, last one. Now finally we get into our big spins, our greater than 360 degree angles, 36.3. Evaluate cosine of 570 degrees and sine of minus 765. All right, and it also helps sometimes to note that uh, one complete spin, I'll write it over here, one complete spin in either direction, but I'll just write it that way, is 360 degrees. That means two complete spins is 720 degrees, and three complete spins is uh, 1080, right? And you can keep adding as you need to. But this is helpful when I get a number this big, I can see, oh, that's gonna be two full spins plus a little bit more. So having these numbers kind of at the surface of your brain will help you make sense of these great big angles. So I can see, for example, this one, it's gonna be one full turnaround, but not two full turns. So I'm going to figure it out. I'm gonna draw the whole thing this time. As you get better, you'll be able to zero in on which quadrant you need but it's positive, so I'm gonna go around one whole time. That gets me to 360. Then another 90 gets me to 450, and then 540, and then I need 30 more, don't I? So that's my 30, that's my 60. Two, one, square root of three. I'm drawing my reference numbers right on there. John tends to draw the triangle and then the reference triangle separately. I like to just combine them and make one picture with everything written in. All right, cosine, we're in the third quadrant. 
Cosine is negative there. Cosine is a hold. So I want the adjacent square root of three over the hypotenuse, which is two. Okay, so that extra spin was the only new thing that we had in handling this one. And now this one, and again, I'll just draw the whole thing. The whole, I'll draw all four quadrants. Later you can start to imagine the quadrants and then zero in on which quadrant your triangle lies in and you don't have to draw, you can draw it bigger. Um, okay, so what this little chart tells me is that the first spin is 360. The second spin gets me to 720. Oh, but I'm going in the wrong direction because I'm going positive. We actually have to go negative, right? So ignore that, I'll start here. There's 360. Let me just scribble that out so it doesn't bother us. There's 360. A second time around is 720. And now I need 45 more, so that's half. So what I have here is a 45, 45, 90. I have one, one square root of two. I'm sine in the fourth quadrant. That's negative. And sine is Oscar had, sine and cosine are the same on these triangles, right? But I always like to just keep my head straight. Um, so it's one over the square root of two. All right, negative one over the square root of two. So if I rationalize this, I'll be able to combine it nicely, won't I? So I'm gonna multiply this to get it rationalized. I have minus square root of two over two, and then I'm just gonna write it over here to combine it. Right, I found my answer there, and I bring it over here to put them together. Their denominators match. So I have minus square root of three minus square root of two. I can't put those together. If I was multiplying, the pigs could come together, but I can't combine them with addition. They have to match, and this is over two. Yay. That's our final answer, and that's our last one of these problems, and we finally got to try, here it is, we finally got to try how this spinning things work, and this is a nice guide. I mean, we, and you can keep adding 360, right? But this is one full spin, two full spins, three full spins, so that you can kind of help guide how many spins you're gonna need before you actually find your terminal angle. It just helps you make sense of it all. And remember here, I fell for the little trick of, oh no, I was measuring it negative. My, that's silly. I was measuring negative. I thought I was measuring positive, but that would have been up. Just remember to do negative or positive. Okay, I bet I confused you. Sorry. All right, last one is boat in the river problems, which we did last year. And I hope you remember that they're fairly painless once you get the formulas nailed. And we're also gonna see that you can use them for planes in the air as well as boats in the river. So what we said is we have a downstream. Remember the deal with these is that your boat has a speed of its own, either how fast you're paddling or rowing or how fast the wind is blowing your sail, or how fast the engine on your boat is propelling you. But we have a downstream equation, and we have an upstream. And in these, we remember the fact that distance equals rate times time, but we have two rates. We have the rate of the boat, and the rate of the current, or the water. John uses those words interchangeably, and he'll sometimes say the boat in still water, which sounds confusing, but it's, he's just saying the boat speed by itself. So when we're going downstream, we're traveling with the speed of the current. So we add the rate of the boat plus the rate of the water and multiply it by the time downstream to get the distance downstream. And when we go upstream, 
This is, and I always think of Lewis and Clark, you guys. Laura and Vivian haven't heard this. This always reminds me of Lewis and Clark, how, you know, they went to St. Louis to kick off their, their exploration in 1803 of the vast, unknown Louisiana Purchase. Thomas Jefferson, my favorite president, sent them out. And the first thing they had to do was canoe, excuse me, canoe. It makes me tired just thinking about it. I have to yawn. They had to canoe all their gear and their whole team up the Missouri River, up the Missouri River. So they were fighting the current the whole way. So they had to be stronger than the water, didn't they? Think of their bulging muscles. Um, they had to be stronger than the water. They had to fight it. So they their speed was reduced by the speed of the water. And when they finally got to the downhill side, you know, they thought they were going to get up into the mountains um, on the Missouri River and then suddenly just find themselves on another water stream going down like a Disneyland ride. Um, it didn't work that way. They had to go a long way across mountains at the top of the continent before they found the downhill, the downstream rivers. But then eventually they went wee down the other side. Okay, so this is how we build our equations. The rates don't have a downstream or an upstream component to them. The speed of the boat and the speed of the water are considered to be the same in both scenarios. But the time is different and the distance is often different. Now, the so this is super important. Once you have this, these problems are manageable. And you need to know this too. So pause me and copy before we go on. Copy to your notebooks. Okay, so we're gonna do one problem. By the way, this is all exactly the same as we did last year. And it's the same as in the book, so I'm sure Laura and Vivian, you did the same. In this one, we're doing air speeds, okay? So our plane, is equivalent to the boat and the wind is equivalent to the water. So we're not gonna change these equations, I'm not gonna write them over, but I'll write those words out too. Um, but the concepts are interchangeable, so we'll use them that way. One day, Shelby found that her plane could fly at five times the speed of the wind. Let's write an equation for that. And let's do it carefully because these are the kind that mess us up. The plane could fly at five times the speed of the wind. That means the plane is faster than the wind, right? So when we go to multiply something by five, we can see oh, we have to multiply the wind by five in order for these to be equal. All right, those are tricky. It's easy to say it's wrong. Oh, the plane's five times faster, so I must multiply five times the plane. No, that's not the way it works. She flew 396 miles downwind, so the distance downwind is 396, in one half hour more then it took her to fly 132 miles upwind. All right, well, let's do distance upwind because that one's really easy, 132. Okay, let's figure out these times. She flew downwind in one half hour more than it took her to fly upwind. So the time downwind is greater than the time upwind. She flew downwind in one half hour more then it took her to fly upwind. So that means we have to add 0.5 there. We could do it with one half as well. Either way, um, for some reason I just wanna do 0.5 and I'm not sure why that is because normally I would want to do, I'll do one half because that's what John does. That way if you, the reason I like to match John's choices is because then if you find yourself looking at the example in the book for any reason, what I did and what John's doing will match, and that makes it easier for you to understand. All right, we are now ready to plug this in. Okay, and then the time upwind, we don't have any new information for that, so we'll just use that. Now we're ready to build our equations. The downstream, and here, I'm gonna do this. 
because I have a feeling I'm going to need this real estate. Okay, so the Sorry, I'm um, thinking instead of writing the plane or the boat, we can write five times the wind plus the wind times the time downstream, which is TU plus one half equals five W minus W times, oh wait, no, that's not true. These are not the same, right? These are different. So this is the downstream equation. This is the speed of the plane, which is the boat, but we're gonna use this value for it, 5W plus W, wind or water, times the time, which is here, the time downstream we said is equal to this. That is gonna equal the distance downstream, which is 396, okay? We can't make them equal to each other because these trips are different, so we have to write separate equations for them. All right, um, and now I'm gonna clean that up and distribute before I go any further. So this all combines to be 6w, and then I multiply it by that and by that, so I get 6w times tu plus 3w equals 396. Okay, and then our other equation is gonna be the upstream, and that's 5w, because that's the speed of the plane, five times the wind, minus the wind times the time upstream equals 132. So this will become 4w, and so then we can say 4 W T U equals 132. Now we need to decide how we're going to combine these two equations. And what I see is this one, we could set them up and try to eliminate them, but because this one only has one variable, it's a package variable, but since it's just the one variable, I say let's divide this by four get a value for this, and then we can substitute it in right there. So what's 132 divided by four? Well, 100 by four is 25, and 32 divided by four is eight. So this must be 33, right? So we can say that this clump of variables, W, T, U, equals 33. Now remember, this doesn't really have any logical value, but it has algebraic value. So we can go ahead and use this and plug it in right there. So we're substituting the, the, of a simplified form of the second equation, right? If this is the first one and this is the second one and we simplified the second one, we're substituting two into one. And that always feels good. We know we're on track. So. 6 times 33, because that's equal to 33, plus 3w equals 396. Let's see what 33 times 6 is. 18, and then that's 18 again, plus 1 is 19. So if we subtract 198 from both sides, we'll get 3w equals... Let's see, it would be 200, but it's 198. Eight. We 
Yeah. It's 198. And then we divide both sides by 3. And that, look, here's 33 times 6 equals that. So I can see that this can break down into 3 times 11 times 6, right? Because I can break down the 33 into 3 times 11 and then times 6. And over here, I've got the same product, but this time I only have, I'm dividing it just by the 3. So that tells me the answer, W equals 66. So that is the speed of the wind. And let's find a unit for it. I look back at the problem. Um, and it's miles per hour. And now we're supposed to also find what's the speed of the plane. So we go back and look. Oh, the speed of the plane is five times the speed of the wind. So what's... 66 times five, let's do it just to make sure. 30 and 30, it would be 330 miles per hour. Sorry, I'm getting a little squishy down here. I'll move it up so you can see it a little more clearly. Um, we figured that the speed of the wind was 65 and we see right here that the plane, the speed of the plane equals five times the speed of the wind. So 66 times five is 330. This is the right answer. It all boils down to these equations, you guys, and then just keeping our wits about us as we multiply. And I mean, as we, as we do the algebra, right? So make sure you've got those copied. I hope you had a good experience with them last year. That is the end of a well thought lesson 36. Good job, you guys. I will see you again very soon. Bye.